Hello and welcome to SA Weekender. On today's show, we've got plenty of things for you to see and do, places to stay, and delicious ideas to tempt you from all around the state. Here's a taste of what's in store. Bryony takes a look at our festival center's exciting new facelift. And Michael goes in search of delicious blue swimmer crabs. There we are, look at that. This is a beauty. But first, here's Kelly. One of my favourite ways to relax is to chill out at the beach, but sadly, the days go too quickly, which got me thinking, why not stay and linger a little longer? Well, today I'm checking out Adelaide's favourite beachside escapes from the budget to the boutique. The beautiful Adelaide coastline from Seacliff to North Haven includes some of our most iconic beach suburbs with their wide sandy beaches and stunning sunsets over the sea. Along this 30 kilometres of coastline, there's a fabulous section of spots to stay, such as great caravan parks and cabins, bed and breakfasts, apartments, holiday houses and high-end hotels. But the accommodation venue I'm about to show you is not only reasonable, it's got to be one of the most unique seaside escapes along this strip. Just 20 steps across the path, across the grass, and you're on the beach. It's a beautiful location. And what do you love about living in Glenelg? It's such a relaxed, friendly village feel, but there's still heaps to do. Beautiful restaurants, lots to do for the children, lots of nightlife as well. Rachel Osborne and her family own Seawall Apartments, which is smack bang on the seafront at Glenelg. They've run Seawall for three generations and have seen those in the know come back to visit time and time again, so they must be doing something right. People really feel like it's a home away from home. We have people coming and staying year after year, often in the same apartment for up to 20 years now. Some of our guests have been staying for 40 years. I've known them before they had children. I've watched their children grow up. It's a real privilege to see that transition in families over the years. Choose from 22 self-contained and fully refurbished apartments, all in various configurations of one to four bedrooms making this place ideal for couples, families, or even large groups looking to holiday together. But my favourite feature is outside. All the apartments here have an outdoor area, and how is this for a barbecue at the beach? The water is literally 20 steps that way. This is the life, I'm telling you. <laughs> This Art Deco building is Olive Court and number two features three bedrooms and a fabulous spa bath that looks out across the ocean. Can't you just picture yourself soaking in here with a glass of bubbles? So we have seven buildings along the seafront here. There's a lot of history. One of the buildings was an old schoolhouse. This building here, beautiful Spanish Deco building. There's some really sweet stables at the rear of the property in a lovely leafy courtyard and a great old fisherman's cottage that was one of the earliest buildings in Glenelg. For more information on Seawall Apartments, as well as all the other fantastic places to stay along our Adelaide coastline, check out the brand new Adelaide Beaches website. It also contains loads of info to help you make the most of your visit to our stunning beaches. And remember, no matter what time of year, rain, hail or shine, there is no better place to unwind than by the coast. Well, I reckon it's time to hit the beach. Next, and Michael rates in the blueies. Bingo. Oh, look at that. Double header. Well, that's not bad for the first pull. Oh, how good is this? I just love York Peninsula. And one of the fabulous things you can do over here is crabbing. And this year, they're out there in their thousands. So here we go. Think dining out on Blue Swimmer Crabs is way too expensive? Well, think again. All you need is a sturdy rake, an old pair of shoes, a crab measure and a floating bucket. And with a bit of know-how, you'll be feasting like royalty. Now it's a bit of a walk out. We're sort of following the tide out as it recedes into the gulf. And we'll find some nice sandy patches and keep our fingers crossed. 
On York Peninsula, you can wade out in search of crabs anywhere from Port Gawler to Stansbury in Gulf St Vincent, or along the Copper Coast around to Port Broughton in the Spencer Gulf. You see the tainted sand, and you put the rake in. Some people really go quick, I go slow, a little slower. And as you're pulling it up, you turn and you'll catch the crab in those forks of the rake. And you turn and uh, <laughs> get your tub and just go bang in like that. And that's it. Now, to find where they're hiding. There we are, look at that. This is a beauty. I'm, of course, on the lookout for a vibrant flash of blue of the male crab, because personally, I don't like to bother the ladies. Okay, so there's two females, which we're not keeping, and they're not big enough anyway, but you can see one there that hasn't got eggs, and that one has. Yeah, look, because it's got row, it's certainly not, to, not a keeper. So away you go, little girl. Don't you dare come back to me. You go home, go on. By law, you must release any female crabs with eggs. This helps to ensure the breeding cycle and sustain future crab stocks. Now, I didn't do too bad at all, but I reckon it's time to check the pots. Ah! But before I head out in the boat, I'm catching up with Randall from Persa, just to clarify the rules. Go there, Randall. Go, Michael, how are you going? Randall, what sort of things should we be aware of when we go out catching crabs? Firstly, you should be aware of the, the bag limits. There's a 20 per person per day bag limit on uh, blue crabs. The other thing that we should be aware of is that there's a minimum legal size to crabs as well. So Randall, we've caught the crabs. Uh, how do we know if they're the legal size or not? You get your gauge, which is 11 centimetres. Yes. You measure from the base of the, of the spines. Oh, oh yeah. And if the uh, gauge can't go over the top, mm. that means it's, it's uh, plenty yeah. big enough. So that one is okay. a massive crab. Yeah. What about uh, the Adelaide coastline? The Adelaide coastline at the moment is holding big quantities of crabs that are accessible for recreational fishers. And off of most of the metropolitan jetties and within the shores, people seem to be raking in day at night, catching crabs anywhere from Grange, Tennyson, and all those sort of local beaches. Now, while raking the shallows can be a lot of fun, you can also drop a crab net from a jetty or a boat. I've enlisted the help of my son, Tom, to head out a little deeper. If you're in a boat, you're allowed to take up to 60 crabs, but only when there's three or more people on board. Otherwise, personal daily limits apply. Bingo. Oh, look at that. Double header. Well, that's not bad for the first pull. We've done well today, so time to get these crabs back to shore to start prepping. My personal recommendation is you put them to sleep in an ice slurry for at least a few hours or even overnight before cooking them. This is my method with the steamer. We've got two compartments with seven crabs in each. Put the top on and when it comes back to the boil, you'll see the steam coming out, so another seven minutes cooking. And then after that, uh, take them out and we put them on racks, they cool down and then finally in the fridge. I find this the easiest and best way to cook crabs without messing around with seawater. Hey, not bad for a morning's work. Have a look at them. I love them this way. But my favourite recipe is chilli crab. And I've got a copy of that on our website. So hop on and have a look at it. It's fabulous. The best months to find blueies are from September to April. For more information, head to the Persa website or call the Fish Watch hotline. And happy crabbing. After the break, we'll get the scoop on Tasting Australia. All you have to do is be there. Attention all foodies. Your favourite annual event is just around the corner and it's bigger and more appetising than ever. Of course, I'm talking about Tasting Australia that will take place over an unprecedented 10 days. Today, I'm meeting its new patron, legendary chef Chong Lu, at the Exeter Hotel. Would you believe this Adelaide institution is where it all started for Chong in South Australia? This is the first place I actually cook out of. Oh, wow. Nanny. So you're coming back to your own roots as well. That's um, cool. Well, like, I spent two weeks as guest chef here cooking yeah. in this pub, an old Adelaide icon, the Exeter Hotel. 
Tasting Australia can only be described as a food and beverage mecca. This is where celebrated international and local chefs, food producers, and wine and spirit makers host out of this world dining experiences and gastronomic adventures. There's a lot of food festivals around the world and around Australia, but I think Tasting Australia does have something particularly special to it. What do you think separates it from other food festivals? I think this time, Tasting Australia is uh, focusing on some of the traditional families that have been involved in the food industry in Adelaide for quite a long time. The Singh family is partnering the Ayubi family, the famous Pavana restaurant. Yeah. I think that's going to be really popular. Another icon, which is Lucia's Cafe, you know, the Rosella family with Nikki and Maria, the two sisters who have been looking after their mum's cafe in the Adelaide Central Market. Yeah. So that's going to be another dinner to look out for. Fantastic. With 140 events happening over 11 SA regions, you're sure to find something to make your taste buds sing. Or if you don't want to book, just head to Victoria Square. It'll be transformed into Town Square, the buzzing hub of it all. Have a bite and meet the makers. And don't forget, it's not just about the food. They have got the East End Cellar Masterclass. Okay. And this year, they're showing the dynasties of the wine in South Australia. Learn more about the taste of different region, okay. different area, different varietals. I think what I love about this year's Tasting Australia is more than ever, like you were saying, it's not just about what's happening in food trends right now and with our producers, with our restaurants, with our winemakers and, and the rest of it, but also looking back into the history of South Australia and what we've done well for a really long time. John, thank you very much, mate. Cheers. Cheers, Callum. Sounds like it's going to be an absolute cracker of a festival. We look forward Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Cheers. Tasting Australia will be taking place from the 13th to the 22nd of April. From casual and relaxed to over-the-top grandeur, you're sure to find something that's just your flavour. So grab a program or take a look at the website. I promise you'll be spoiled for choice. But be warned, events sell out fast. So book early and I'll see you there. Coming up, our Festival Centre's exciting new facelift. And I'm here for a closer look. This is a place where ideas are transformed into performances and where audiences come to immerse themselves in all sorts of different worlds. The Adelaide Festival Centre is undergoing a transformation of its own and I'm here for a closer look. A theatre comparable to any in the world. Pretty strong dreaming for a city the size of ours, but a dream that nevertheless has come true. It's all happened in less than three years. Happened with sound, professional planning, bold imagination, a great deal of style, and to quote a commercial, with a minimum of fuss. And in the 45 years since, there's hardly been a dull moment. As the crew bumps in the latest production, the centre's artistic director, Douglas Gautier, meets me to explain his long-standing ties to the theatre. Douglas, your connection with this space goes all the way back to opening night, I believe. What's the story? Well, 1973 and the opening night, they did uh, uh, Beethoven's Ninth and also the second act of his opera, Fidelio, and I was an extra in it. I had a few lines, and uh, in those days I had blonde hair, but I had a wonderful experience, and Lee was the beginning of a love affair with this place and the idea of it, which has lasted to this day. It wasn't the last time Douglas graced the stage here. He's returned time and again in various roles, so it's fitting that he's now here as a major player in the Festival Centre's $90 million rejuvenation. It's part of the wider redevelopment of the Festival Plaza precinct and the most significant facelift for the theatre since it was built. And even though it's still a way off completion, 10,000 visitors flocked to the recent open day to see what's new. Already in place is the Walk of Fame. Jackie Weaver, all-round performer. Carrie Sweet, local guy who's made it in the film and television stage. Sean McAuliffe, everyone knows. Eric Clapton, probably the greatest uh, 
rock and roll guitarist of the 20th century, still performing, and Wills, a wonderful local performer, as is Paul Blackwell, a great actor. Marcel Massot, international performer. Didn't say a lot. Didn't say a lot, did not say a lot. And it will keep on growing by three plaques per year, chosen by the Festival Centre Trust, the critics and the public. Boyers will be getting an upgrade, as will technical equipment in the theatres, and some zest has been added to food and beverage options. But the major difference patrons will notice is the opening up of the complex towards the riverbank. Now, necessity is the mother of invention because the car park is being built at the back here and that, that is all, all being redeveloped. So we have turned around, as you can see, to face the river with the walk, the amphitheatre when it opens and our main entrance. We see a lot of people now, of course, coming down this area and going across to the Oval. And the great thing about Australia is that people don't just do sports or the arts and entertainment. We do everything. So it is a continuing journey of this place on the river bringing great artists and people together. A few blocks south, there's another major redevelopment in the wings. Her Majesty's Theatre has just closed for a two-year hiatus, while the auditorium's expanded to three levels and the neighbouring building is absorbed into the complex. The aim is to put the elegant but ageing dame firmly back in the spotlight as one of the country's best theatrical venues. But don't worry, there's still plenty to keep us all entertained back at the Festival Centre. To join in, just follow the Yellow Brick Road. I know I hope sway over all